My name is Julian Willard. And I'm Jim Mack, and this is Pineal Express, where trains of thought intersect. If you like Pineal Express, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash pineal express. At various levels of support, our patrons receive extra episodes of the show and other bonus content. Mark Blythe is a professor of political economy at Brown University. His research sheds light on phenomena, including wealth inequality, generational difference in political economics, austerity, and neoliberalism. Since reading his comprehensive book, Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea, we had been wanting to chat with Mark Blythe about how we arrived at our current political and economic moment and what lies ahead. Mark spoke to us about several issues close to our hearts, like neoliberalism versus populism, the decline of centrist politics, tax policy, unions, health care, and why it's important not to downplay the economic component of some voters' anti-immigration attitudes, or else the right will continue to sway such voters. Given that we are based in the decreasingly populated, post-industrial, and opioid-ravaged Broome County, New York, these issues are personal for us, so we're more than happy that Mark was willing to unpack the relevant, structural considerations for us. So without further delay, welcome Mark Blythe to Pineal Express. Mark, something you make clear throughout your book, Austerity, is that the 2008 recession in the U.S. and EU was not due to excessive public spending, but in fact was a banking and private sector crisis. Uh, This private sector crisis, as you've mentioned in some of your talks, was due to the effects of 30 years worth of neoliberal public policy. I've heard you use the metaphor of a laptop's hardware and software to help explain how this neoliberal shift occurred. Could you please talk about this metaphor in terms of why the software of neoliberalism has been patched into our political operating system since the 1970s and how it brought us to our current economic reality? I like the, I like the way you phrase that, the way it's been patched into our system. That's really good. Uh, all right, let me start with something just for clarification so that everybody's on the same page. If I say to you or to anybody who's listening to this, should we pay back public debt? Most people will say debt bad must pay back, right? You want to pay back your debts. You don't want to have excessive debt. You'd rather spend the money on something else. It's all perfectly reasonable. Right. But it doesn't work when it's public debt because when you say you want to pay back public debt, what you're actually saying is you want to destroy private savings because the public debt is private sector savings. When you buy a treasury bill, that's a savings bond. And the reason treasury auctions have never failed is because the world is short what's called safe assets. And the safest liquid asset that gives you a guaranteed return and you will get back whole after 10 years is U.S. federal debt, which is why we can print as much as we want and there's never a crisis despite what everybody says. Mm -hmm. So I want to put that out there just to understand this, right? Private sector savings are the public debt and vice versa. Okay. Now, let's do the whole computer analogy thing. When you think about capitalism as a system, You can get very esoteric and and think in all sorts of abstract terms. A very concrete way to do it is this way. If you have a laptop computer, let's say you've got a PC and you've got a Mac side by side and you get frustrated and you drop them both on the floor. When you look into the internal guts, you'll find that they look very similar, but they're arranged in different ways. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a hard drive. Everybody has, well, these days you actually don't have a mechanical hard drive, you have a digital hard drive, but nonetheless... Uh, You have a hard drive, you have memory, you have a motherboard, you maybe have a graphics processor, and and it's going to be in a different position somewhere on the board vis-a-vis another one. But everybody has the same stuff. Now, let's call that the hardware of capitalism. And what I mean by that is everybody has a labor market, but the American labor market, huge, diverse, and very dynamic and flexible and individualistic in its focus, it's very different from the labor market where unions are still big in Germany, for example, or in Sweden. Uh, Let's think capital markets. The United States is enormous capital market, so much that we can have shows like Mad Money on MSNBC just basically tracking indexes up and down for no apparent reason. Uh, Meanwhile, if you go to Germany again, 50% of all companies don't even list on an exchange and don't issue shares to the public. So capitalism has the same institutions, but they're put together in different configurations. And that limits what the machine can and cannot produce. Now, next part of the analogy, what's the software? It's the economic ideas that we run on it. And why do we write a certain set of programs and protocols for specific hardware and specific times? Because we're responding to the problems that we're facing. So the way I think about this is that there was a kind of 
economic institutions qua computer that everybody ran from 45 to about 75. Mm -hmm. And it looked like this. Coming out of the Great Depression and World War II, the one thing that governments across the world, from the United States to Sweden to Italy, wanted to make sure was that we didn't all try and kill each other again. And the proximate cause of World War II was the Great Depression and the rise of fascism. And the sobering thought of having Stalinist tanks 60 kilometers from Berlin as a permanent feature certainly focused the mind as well. Right. So Western government said, no more finance doing what it wants to do, no more massive inequality, and above all, full employment. Now, how do you make full employment happen? Well, the Swedish economy is very different from the American, from the Italian, but you kind of got the same hardware. It's just configured in different ways. So you write slightly different versions of the software. But here's what all of them had in common in terms of the way the, the motherboard was configured. So the first thing you have to do is create a national economy. And what I mean by that is it's open to trade and things you can buy and sell and drop on your foot, whether it's bricks or cars or loaves of bread, but you don't allow finance to do very much indeed. So you're not allowed to uh, bet against currencies. There are no derivatives markets. If you think about the US, the way that banking was structured in the 40s through the 70s, there were four types of banks commercial banks, investment banks, savings and loans and trusts. Each one did a different thing. They were not allowed to play in each other's playpen. It was hyper-regulated. So you've got homogenous national economies, relatively isolated, the trade in goods and some services. Finance is locked in a box. How then do you manage to get investment up to produce full employment? You give tax incentives to make sure that businesses invest at home and also have high marginal taxes to fund transfers across the distribution. That way you can fund public goods like the GI Bill, education, expansion of uh, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody has a version of this going on. When you get to labor markets, what do you have? You've got big labor and big capital. What you have in America is the COLA contract. United Auto Workers on the one side, General Motors on the other, bargaining over who gets what in productivity. And from 45 to 75, the link between the two was very solid. You bargained for what you earned in productivity gains, and it was very much mutual and, and positive sum. And then finally, if you think about the economic institutions, these days we think about the Fed and central banks as being important, but in this period, they weren't important at all. Nobody knew the name of the guy who ran the central bank in the 50s, McChesney Martin. It's only laterally that it became rock stars, and that's because the regime shifted and they became rock stars for a specific reason. And what was that reason? That was a nice set of institutions. It was very labor friendly, it produced full employment. And here in a very simple way is your problem. If I guarantee full employment for 30 years, I know that no government, Republican or Democrat, is going to allow unemployment to go to six or 7%. So that means if I'm fighting a massive war off the books in Southeast Asia, as I was in Vietnam for nearly a decade, my real unemployment rate's about 2%. Given this, the dumbest person in any firm can walk out the door at 12 o'clock and get a better paid job by three. And at the top end of the distribution, you just have to keep bidding up wages if you want to get skilled labor. The only way that business can cope with this is by raising prices. And what you get is what's called the classic wage price spiral of inflation. Now, here's why inflation is a problem for capitalism when it's generated this way. Money can't escape to find a better rate of return. It's all held up in these silos and regulations. So if I'm a businessman, particularly a financial person, and I've got an expected 5% rate of return on a mortgage bond that I've lent to someone, and inflation goes to 7%, I might as well take my money around the back of the house and burn it. So essentially, capitalists go on a capital strike. They stop investing because it's simply destructive. And that's when you get that weird thing called stagflation, the simultaneous occurrence of unemployment and inflation at the same time, because investment collapses because pro expectations of future profits are negative. Right. So when that happens, there's a political and economic reset. We reconfigure the hardware, and we do that by getting new people to write the software. The new people were Mrs. Thatcher and Ronald Reagan as the most famous examples, but this happened all the way through the OECD. And the idea was, let's set up the hardware in a very different way. Rather than full employment, the problem we now face is price stability. Because if we don't have stable prices, if we don't kill inflation, there's no return to being a capitalist. And that's pretty much the end of the game. And people with money are not willing to accept that game. And capitalism does actually deliver certain goods and services, and a lot of people like it. So let's try and save it. And that's basically what restoring the real rate of return was.
And you do this through taking policy away from policymakers and giving it to technocrats, particularly central bankers who become more prominent, particularly by the time you get to the 1990s. But what you also do is you globalize your labor markets. The conjunction of technological change, the container ship, the rise of the computer, fiber optic networks, and that Wi-Fi networking means that you can outsource jobs. You can move your plant and equipment everywhere. So the iPhone you probably got in your pocket has got components from about 15 different countries assembled in China, but only $50 of value resides in China. The rest of it goes to California and disappears into tax havens uh, like Ireland. So you create this incredibly complex world. But when you do that, you take all the air out of your national labor markets. So unions, particularly when you beat up on them for a decade and a half, uh, become very, very weak. You go from 30% unionization to 10% unionization in the US private sector. And what you get as a corollary of that is wage stagnation. So profits start going through the roof again, but wages start to remain flat and remain flat for basically the 80th percentile from zero to 80 of the US distribution right the way through to the present. So now we're in this moment to take this forward for a second, whereby we keep puzzling about why there's no wage growth. Well, it's pretty simple. We broke the mechanisms that linked productivity growth and wage growth. All the returns go to capital. And if you don't like it, they can move your job abroad and they're under no obligation to give you any more. So that's pretty easy to explain. Now, having built this world of integrated labor markets, integrated financial markets where the central bank becomes dominant, You've got wage stagnation, but you're still growing and you're still creating massive profits. Well, what happens is that you're in a quality skew. Now, how do people keep on going when their wages aren't rising? Well, you've just liberalized your financial sector in a period of very high interest rates and everybody wants to borrow. So we all start to borrow and borrow like mad. There's a 200 percent rise in consumer credit across the uh, European countries over a 20 year period and nearly 300 if you go back to the 1960s to the to the United States today. So we create massive amounts of private debt. The debt that we call our liabilities are what banks call assets, which is why by 2008 the whole system had three problems. It wasn't inflation this time, it was inequality and bank leverage that was doing it along with wage stagnation. So when you put these three things together, you build a very fragile system that's built upon revolving credit, but it's private sector credit. Now, along comes a bunch of stinky mortgages. This exposes how hyper levered these institutions are. They've got very little capital and lots of stuff out there at risk. The risk can't be internalized. We invent too big to fail. We have to bail this all out. So essentially, you detonate private credit markets. These are the problem, private credit markets. And the cost of saving those institutions, recapitalizing them, the huge budget deficits that result because taxes dry up because of the shock to unemployment and the lack of growth that's caused by the recession, that's what leads to a transfer effectively onto the public balance sheet so that debt in the United States, which was stable at around 60% of GDP, skyrockets to 100. It's all the cost of bailing out the financial system and coping with the recession. Now, at this point in time, having basically given authority to do anything over to the central bankers and sympathy to them, they didn't really want to run the world, but politicians were too busy tweeting about things to actually run things. They gave all those powers away and it turns out they've only got two powers. They can raise and lower the price of money, which has been low since the crisis, or they can buy and sell assets, which was called quantitative easing. So they did a lot of both. They did about $17 trillion worldwide, if you include all the big central banks. And the weird thing is, because we've globalized everything, there's no inflation in any of the core countries. So what does that create? That creates a world in which you basically continue to create the inequality skew because all the profits from quantitative easing push up the price of assets like houses and bonds and stocks. So those who already have those get more. Mm-hmm. Uh, the people at the bottom who basically didn't have the great didn't have the Great Depression, but nonetheless certainly had a lot of problems over the past 10 years, still have stagnant wages. There's no inflation to eat away their debts. Interest rates are low so they can keep rolling them, but they never get out of debt. And then the political classes that run the shop come along and say, hey, everything's fine. We're back to full employment. Let's defend the legacy. I'm sure you guys remember this from the last election. Running around places like Ohio and upstate New York saying everything's fine. Well, people basically go, actually, you know what? It's really, really not fine. And it's really not fine in a lot of places, not just the United States. This story applies to France and applies to Italy. All of Southern Europe, to a great degree, succumbed to exactly this. And the Europeans made it worse by doubling down on austerity policies. Mm 
So, you know, that's basically the story. We have these two computers. One of them blows up with inflation. The other one blows up because of uh, inequality and leverage. We save it because of massive monetary transfusions. But where we are now requires a new computer and a new set of institutions and some new software. The incumbent powers refuse to write the new software. So what you get is populists. Populists are rogue code writers. Whether they're on the left or the right, what they're trying to do is write new software for the hardware we actually have. Mm. Well, that is a great detailed explanation of how we got here, Mark. And uh, I wanted to ask a follow-up about uh, something that you had said. You mentioned that inflation blew up the computer in the 1970s, basically. You mentioned that there was an effective capital strike and it led to stagflation and these neoliberal policies that empowered central banking and deregulated also ended up blowing up the economy in 2008. So my question is, what policies should have been implemented to fight inflation back in the 1970s, if not for those neoliberal ones? Right. Great question. So here's the thing. Do you want to reform capitalism, replace it or perfect it? I'd like to personally, I'd like to replace it. Your answer. <laughs> I'd like to replace it if that's all right with you. <laughs> OK, so then you have the grand design problem. And I really worry about the grand design because I, 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 I research this stuff for a living. Uh, I'm pretty close to what's going on. I'm, I'm not the stupidest person in the world. And if you ask me to design an alternative system to capitalism, I would say epic fail right at the start. Those types of massive planning and engineering problems, uh, pro programs, usually end up being disasters. You have to be very careful because these are evolving set of complex institutions that we barely understand the linkages between. So the grand design project usually ends up being pretty bad. Right. That, that's just my take on it. So your next one is, do you want to reform it? OK, well, what do you want to reform it to be? Do you want it to reform it to be in a, a capitalism that's fair to everyone? Because if you do, you shouldn't have bailed out the financial sector. Right. You should have let it fail. But if you let it fail, let's be clear about what we're saying here. You're saying that in one shape or form or another, not just the top people who the, the 1% of the 0.1 percent lose out. You're saying that people's pensions disappear. You're saying that their mortgages disappear, or at least you're going to take that risk by allowing this entire system, which has been running on nothing but finance for 30 years, to radically de-level. Or alternatively, you kick the can down the road, you stick your fingers in your ears, and you hope for the best. That's what we did. Now, are there alternatives to that? Yes, we could have thought smartly about how to delever the system, how to basically build a capitalism with airbags that basically reduces massively the amount of dependence on finance. That in and of itself is a huge undertaking. It took 30 years to build this system, 10 years to bail it. So, and in particularly in that moment, sympathy of the people, you know, even Geithner and so on and so forth, who were charged with figuring out what to do in those crisis moments when it was far from clear what the relationship between esoteric things like asset backed commercial paper and credit default swaps and all the rest of it actually was. You have to basically pull a whole new design for capitalism out your ass in the middle of a crisis in about five days. That's a big ask for anybody. So, I think what you do is you. Take, the best thing you can do is you can learn from what we know now with 10 years of hindsight and say, OK, maybe it was true, and I still have doubts about this, that systemic risk means too big to fail, means you have to bail these things. But then let's stop that. Let's make a world in which there is no systemic risk. So you limit the size of financial institutions. You do the exact opposite of the bill that just went through Congress. Right. Mm -hmm. You basically limit their leverage. Oh, well, then you'll hurt lending. OK, well, we all think people have too much debt. Let's make head credit harder to come by. Well, then how are people going to survive? Well, if you do that, then maybe companies would have to raise wages. So we would actually have to do a kind of trial and error, think about where we want to get to and what we want to see in the world and how we get there and how these parts fit together. OK, moving on to the next question. Uh, we've got Julian here. I'd like to talk about the rhetoric surrounding tax cuts in the United States as you pointed out, politicians such as Paul Ryan are currently talking about cuts to Social Security as a means to cut the deficit. So, <laughs> so, so what would you say to politicians like this who argue that we have a public spending problem, not a revenue problem? Well, look, they're either idiots or they're liars. So take your pick. I'm, I'm not going to cast aspersions on someone. I'll leave it to the public to decide. Right. But look, let's play both sides, right? This is why you're an idiot if you think this, because it's really very simple. 
The United States, in particular the United States, issues a thing, something called the dollar. The dollar is what's called the global reserve asset, which means everybody else in the world needs to earn dollars in order to import things like food. We get to print this stuff. It's also the one thing that everybody wants to hold as a freak out asset, whether in the form of treasury bills, which are swaps for cash that give you interest rate, or in the form of raw cash. So if you go on the news today, you'll find that the Turkish lira is down 20%. And what's the first thing the president of Turkey says? I want you to turn in your dollars and your gold for Turkish lira to support the currency. And what is everybody going to do? They're going to hold dollars until you clutch it from their cold, dead hands. Mm -hmm. So we have an asset, we get to print an asset that the rest of the world literally will die for. So we have a deficit. Okay, so we have a deficit. What does that mean? It means that you're not bringing in enough taxes. Well, why are we not bringing enough taxes? Well, I don't know, because in 2010, I paid more taxes personally than General Electric. Fact. That in 2016, Apple paid effectively no taxes, and it's the world's trillion dollar company. We've made a series of choices over the past 30 years that make sure that basically rich people and corporations pay absolutely nothing and poor people pay everything. And I mean that in the sense of if you look at sales tax and consumption taxes, that's the major driver for many budgets. And the deficits in that can only be made up by basically charging everybody 20% every time they buy something because we're unable to tax the things that we used to. Mm -hmm. So if you're worried about it, it's an accounting problem. Just raise taxes on the things that you no longer raise taxes on. But more fundamentally, it's ultimately bullshit because this is the United States. There's never been a failed treasury auction. There's a shortage of safe liquid assets in the world, of which treasury bills are the best example. And if the United States decided to run an experiment where basically decided to do a 10% deficit for two years, would interest rates rise? Probably. Would it be the same thing that happens to Argentina if they tried that? Absolutely not, because nobody wants to hold the Argentine um, Argentine bonds. Right. But they all want to hold American bonds. So, on the one, you know, it, either you're just deliberately dense, or you really don't understand very basic things. Right? So to sound harsh, but that's it. The other one is you're a liar, and you're a liar because you're paid by sp specific interests to tell stories that enable rich people not to pay taxes. And that's what most of the sort of deficit panic institutions in DC are. They're set up by billionaires to scare the bejesus out of everyone so that old people don't have social security because God forbid they ever have to pay a wealth tax. And that's all lies. Despite either the disingenuous at best or lying at worst on the right, you also have talked about the idea that Democrats don't really have any coherent or convincing message for the majority of the country either. Uh, well, this yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example. So uh, Sanders invited me in to come and give testimony a couple of years ago at the Senate Finance Committee, and uh, I did. And the one thing that I was basically told was, for God's sake, don't say either deficits don't matter or we have the dollar, it doesn't matter. Now, both of these things are true. The former is true because of the latter. But nonetheless, you're just not allowed to say that. We have to play in the sandbox that the Republicans have already parsed out. Well, once you do that, you're just playing at the margins, right? And if you, the only thing, the Democrats have been doing this since the 1970s. Uh, the twin deficits in the 1980s, Clinton versus the Republicans in the 1990s. And we always fall into this trap. They have this rhetoric whereby, oh my God, the deficit, we're all going to die whenever the Democrats are in power. And then we don't die, but they keep up this terrible panic. And then the Republicans get in and they just don't give a shit. And they do massive tax cuts for the rich and they blow a hole in the deficit and they say deficits don't matter. And then the Democrats, rather than calling them out and go, these people are so fiscally irresponsible. Mm -hmm. If we were in power, we can do that. And it's like, yeah, but that's irrelevant because what's happening is they're giving a massive stimulus, mainly to people at the top. The economy is growing, hence where we are now, even if wages aren't growing. They can claim victory and you just sound like the party pooper. And then when you come in, you actually do this. Now, here's the problem. There's a thing called yield curve inversion. Stay with me. And it's when long term interest rates and uh, short term interest rates get out of sync. When you've got higher long rates and short rates, that basically suggests that people are not confident about the future and it's a harbinger of recession. You know what's a better indicator? Whenever the government runs a surplus. And here's why. Here's the opposite of your deficit story. Any economy can be cut into three sectors. You've got households who do consumption. You've got businesses who do investment. You've got government who do public goods. 
If the government is not running a deficit, if it's being German and running a surplus or basically paying back its deficit, that means it's saving. The government sector is saving. Corporates around the world, all of them have so much money, they're net savers, which means the only people who are spending to keep this thing going have to be households. Now, as we've established, households are up to their neck in debt and would rather actually save. In fact, if there's one bunch of people that needs to save, it's households, it's not corporates and it's not governments. Now, just ask yourself the following question. What happens if all three sectors save at once? It's a recession. So basically what people are arguing for is not just when you want to pay back debt, you're arguing for the destruction of private sector savings. You're actually saying the world would be better if everybody saved all at once. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a fallacy of composition. It can only lead to the shrinkage of the economy. The Europeans tried it between 2011 and 2014, and it was a disaster. Right. Yeah, I mean, so you're you're constraining capital by doing that. You're constraining investment by doing that. But it, it also seems that we hear a lot about redistributionist policies, people talking about we don't want uh, to institute policies on the left that will redistribute income. But a consequence of what you're saying, Mark, is that it seems like there already is redistributionist policies in effect right now, but the redistribution is going toward the top. Yeah, that's it. For the past 30 years, we've had redistribution to the top. I mean, one of the great Republican tropes is, you know, the unashamedly embrace trickle down economics. The problem is there's no evidence, literally no evidence that it works. It all trickles up. Very simple one. Just everybody go online and Google U.S. labor share of GDP. Loads of people have calculated this. You get it at Brookings, you get it at the Hamilton Project, loads of things. And what you find is that basically there's been a 10 point swing away from labor towards everybody else. Now, let's clarify what this means. 95% of the United States in the, the work, right, get W-2s. That means your labor. Now, everybody else who doesn't get W-2s, that's capital, that's 5% of the population. So that means 10% of GDP over a 20 year period has gone to 5% of the population. That's your inequality skew. It's complete trickle up. Right. And Mark, so I wanna talk about some of the consequences of that trickle up. In the Mixed Mental Arts interview with Hunter Motz, you suggested that at some point it's going to be in the oligarchs' interest to stop wrecking the economy while they impose austerity on everyone else. And you summed it up by saying the Hamptons are not a defensible position. The idea, right. the idea being that if things get bad enough, citizens will rebel against the oligarchs. And I'm just thinking, geography aside... Maybe the Hamptons are a defensible position because the people there seem to have the resources to sequester themselves in their own kind of Elysium and used militarized police, LRAD anti-riot devices and electronic surveillance to squash any rebellion. So what do you think about that? No, I think that's totally fair. I mean, maybe I do underestimate the collective action costs of, re of rebellion. I mean, we see that on a local level. You see this in the way that sort of uh, poor communities are more heavily policed than rich communities. You see it in the way that, uh, as we see in the press every day, that the police are just called on black people as a weapon used by white people in many in many situations. So, yeah, trickle that up, the income distribution and all the things that you mentioned are there. That's it. But, but here's the problem. I always call this the, this is the problem when the libertarian buys their own fire brigade. Right. So in principle, you know, you don't actually have to have public goods. Everybody have private goods. And if you don't have private goods substitutes, then you're just lazy and poor. Right. So I'm a libertarian, grotesquely unequal world. I bought my own fire brigade. Mm -hmm. This is great if my house is on fire. It's really good if my friend's house is on fire. But if the entire city is on fire and I'm the last structure standing, my little fire brigade ain't going to cut it. So these things may work in the short term. But in the long term, if you continue these trends, it doesn't work. Remember, Elysium worked because they were in outer space. Right. Yes, that did help. <laughs> right. If they were on planet Earth, you'd still get to them. Mark, I, I want to talk about unions and I want to talk briefly about the recent Janus decision from the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, for people that don't know, this was a decision that weakened public sector unions by imposing a free rider problem. Essentially, public sector workers can now withhold union dues while still benefiting from the union's collective bargaining. Uh, what are your thoughts on Janus from a political economy perspective, and what does it mean for the future of unions in the U.S.? So if you want to look at one place that seems to have rising wages, despite the fact that the underlying growth rate is weaker than us, it's actually Europe. 
So about 40 years ago, Europe stopped doing austerity. They figured out it was self-defeating. I like to think it's because they read my book, but that's probably not the reason. <laughs> and uh, because of that, the economies were allowed to run deficits. What's called automatic stabilizers kicked in. Taxes basically went up. Deficits were allowed to grow despite that. And what you ended up with was more economic activity, blah, 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 blah. So what do you end up with? You end up with rising wages. Now, here's the interesting correlation. The more people you have in unions in those societies, the stronger the wage growth. So there's been a 30-year campaign by the Koch brothers, before that by the Business Roundtable, by the think tanks in DC, from AEI through to Cairo, et cetera, which are unions are bad, unions are bad, unions are bad, right? Right to work rules, moving plants from the north to the south, busting unions. And it's been tremendously successful. And we went the other way. We went from 30% unionization in private sector to just under, just over 10%. Now, the one holdout in this was public sector unions, where you still have around 30% unionization. So there's been a massive campaign by billionaire interests to destroy public sector unions. Why? Because it's the last bastion of organization. And when you do that, literally all of the returns to investment will bypass labor because there's no other mechanism to redistribute them through or to demand your share of productivity. Right. In economics, we have a couple of fantasy objects. One of our fantasy objects is the notion of the marginal productivity theory of labor that says you get paid according to the product that you produce. Really? That makes bankers the most productive people in the world. I find that really <laughs> hard to believe. Um, so, you know, the fantasy object works in the following way, and it worked from 45 through 73, because you had big unions and you had big business, and they sat down and said, all right, here's the deal. This year we're going to do 2% on wages. And the unions went, fuck you, we want 5%. And then they said, no, nah, we can do three and a half. And they went, well, I about four, not three and a half. And they go, all right, maybe there's a strike, maybe not, but that's what you sell. And then you're basically taking your share. Now, if those institutions aren't there anywhere, right? Let's say you walk into a nice friendly company like Whole Foods or Apple, right? And how much do you pay for this job? I pay 11.50 an hour, blah, 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 the rest of it, right? Okay, uh, that's great. So you do the job, you do the job for two years. You're there like, can I get a pay rise? No. Well, why not? Well, first of all, I'm just a manager who's also on a fixed rate. I have no authority to do this. It's all set centrally. Oh, okay, so there's no way that anybody in this firm can ever get more. Can labor increase its share? No, and if you keep causing trouble like that, we'll have you fired because you've got no rights because there's no collective bargaining. So when you look at societies that basically haven't gone down that line as much, you find that strong economic growth and even weak economic growth translates into higher wages. And when you go our way, the reason, one of major reasons that working people are getting poorer is because they have no institutional mechanisms or economic power mechanisms to demand that they get their share of productivity again. And uh, the idea of working people getting poorer, Mark, I, I know that you have really highlighted that in the context of voters voting behavior as it relates to populism, their support for populism, especially recently, whether that be far right populism, whether that be left populism. And so I wanted to ask some questions about uh, voting behavior and political science. So sure. here's the first one. So Mark, I mean, as I interpret it, your work cuts against what I was taught was some long held tenets of political science. And I wanted to ask you about these tenets. So maybe you could tell me why they're wrong. Uh, one is median voter theory. So back when I studied political science, I was taught that in the U.S., the electorate falls along a left-right political spectrum, and whichever politician sways the median voter, the theoretical voter in the dead center, will always win. And yet your work demonstrates that so-called centrist politics are dying. So whatever happened to the median voter? Um, he never existed. His, his political science is fantasy object. The, the book that's been very instructive in changing this debate is by a guy called Marty Gillens, Martin Gillens, and it's called, I think it's called Inequality and Democracy, I, I always forget titles, it's Princeton 2015, and basically what he shows is the following. Um, so imagine that you've got the income distribution in the United States, you cut it in its percentiles, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, up to 100 so poorest to richest. And then you look at what Congress thinks they want to do. And then you look at what Congress actually puts out. Then you look at what people in each of those bits of the distribution want. What you find out is that there's a very, very high correlation between what people in the 80th to the 100th percentile want and talk about and what Congress actually produces. And basically no correlation between what people from the zero to the 80 want and talk about and what Congress produces. The median starts halfway up the 80th percentile. They're the bit that matters. 
Second one is these days politics has become so bifurcated in a truly partisan and pathological way that how can we talk about a median voter? We've got surveys that show that people these days, if they're really strong liberal Democrats, would actually cut off their daughter's allowance or inheritance if she married a Republican. Where's the median? Right. <laughs> right. So I mean, the, the, just you know, economics has its fantasy objects, one of which is the marginal productivity the theory of labor, and that's the political science one. It just isn't true. Now, there's work by a guy called Brian Burgoon, who's in Amsterdam, who took Gillen's framework and did more sort of refined statistics on it. Because the way that Gillen did it was essentially, he was, did what's called a dummy variable, a simple yes or no to whether programs were in the set or not in the set. And Brian did a much more gradated one and some other people have done this and they took it to Europe. And what they found is the same results hold. There's a bit more leeway in some countries, but somebody replicated the Gillen's framework for Germany, which is actually ostensibly a much more equal country. They didn't just find exactly the same thing. They found that what the Bundestag delivers, the parliament delivers, goes to the 80th percentile and even above the 80th percentile. Hmm. So that is interesting. So, I mean, that that just refutes it right there. Like you mentioned, the uh, you, you would expect by population the median voter to be in the center of the economic distribution, but the actual voter that has all the power is the one up in the top 20 percentile. What, what a shock, the one with the money counts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give an example, right? So I live here in Providence, right? So I'm a professor at Brown. Uh, Providence is not a rich city. It's not, it's not a poor city, but most of the wealth is concentrated in one part of the city. And uh, I get invitations by email and various things like that. We're having a fundraiser for this politician and this guy, the mayor's coming around to someone's house to have a chat, right? Now, you know, down the road from me, just a few blocks away, is an African-American part of uh, the city. I wonder how much those people, how much time those people are spending there listening to them. All right. Similarly, I was taught that voters have single peaked preferences in their politics such that they want some ideal policy position referred to in political science as their bliss point and that they increasingly dislike everything to the left and right of that. But your work suggests that there must be a strong contingent of voters who instead have double-peaked preferences insofar as they just hate the status quo. They're, they're not doing well in the system, and they want populist change no matter whether it comes from the right or the left. So how did political scientists get the shape of voters' preferences so wrong? Um, I think because they assumed they were rational. I mean, in, in this sort of the strict economic sense, of you have transitive preferences which are hierarchical and, and follow a, a certain sequence. So, you know, to take the classic Arrow's example, I like strawberry ice cream, I like vanilla ice cream, I like chocolate ice cream. If I prefer strawberry to chocolate and I prefer vanilla to uh, strawberry, then I can't actually prefer chocolate to vanilla to get the point, right? So we assume that our, tra our preferences are transitive and then you can work up things like bliss points and all the rest of it. I've never bought any of this stuff. I never thought it was any of this at any purchase. So a little example of this today, if you go to my Twitter feed, you'll find a little graph that I put out there I got from the BBC. Now, if you go back to the Scottish referendum and independence, there's a really interesting skew in the voting stats to do with age. So essentially, Scottish young people, 60% of them said, yeah, let's get out. And 60 plus percent of the old people said, no, we're gonna stay. And the way I explained this was perfectly economically rational, is the following. I'm old, that means I have assets. If I have assets and Scotland becomes independent, I'll probably end up with a new currency. Given that I'd rather have gilt edge securities rather than kilt edge securities for my pension, I don't want to get out. I don't want to have devaluation risk or inflation risk on my assets. I'm young. I grew up in a shitty period of time called the Great Recession. I don't have any assets. Fuck you. I'll just go for it. Right? right. Makes perfect sense. Right? Here's the thing. You look at if the, the Beeb did this thing, of the, somebody did a survey. They said if the Brexit referendum were held today, it would be the result. And it's an exact or reverse of 2016. So what you have is 52% that would stay in, 48% get out. That's not the interesting bit. What tracks the same as last time is the age distribution. And in this case, all the young people want to stay in and all the old people want to get out. Now, my explanation for Scotland cannot work there. Because what you've got is old people with assets who are going to engage in policies called Brexit that will absolutely devalue the pound and anything denominated in pounds. And yet the further you go out in the age distribution, which correlates with how much wealth you have, 
the more intense they are for Brexit. That is not economically rational. So basically, all the stuff about bliss points, peaks, etc., it's all based upon transitive preferences, etc., and I just don't think it works. Right. The underlying assumptions are just incorrect to begin with. You, we yeah, shouldn't even support these actions. If you want to be studied about it, essentially, voting behavior, like most things in the world, is a non-organic process. There is no regular underlying generator which, di- which generates a distribution which creates a tractable or quasi-normal distribution. So you can't generalize from it. I mean, yeah, I mean, all of this also sparks, you know, the question which has been asked in research for decades, which is, if you really want to view voters as entirely rational, it's not rational for them even to vote, but yeah, <laughs> we could exactly. get into Political that. science fantasy object number 14, we know that none of this makes sense because that's the conclusion, yet we keep going with it because we don't have anything else. I once heard this called Shepsley's Law of Wing Walking, don't let go of something until you've got something else. And my rejoinder to that was always, what about eugenics? Because until the rise of the molecular biology, we didn't really have any type of theory linking genetics and behavior after eugenics. But we didn't keep eugenics because it was Nazi. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, Mark, in the Mixed Metal Arts podcast with Brian Callen, you gave a great defense of single payer health care. Uh, in that same vein, there was a recent study funded by the Koch brothers intended to discredit single payer, which actually no, fa- really they did that. I'm absolutely <laughs> shocked. <laughs> <laughs> which what they actually found in the study was that approximately over a 10 year period, we could save upwards of two trillion dollars with single payer. So I'm curious to know your thoughts on how best to articulate to Americans that single payer healthcare is more efficient and humane than our current system. Yeah, I could do that, but I want to go somewhere else with it. This is why it's very, very hard for this to happen in the United States, and it's not the usual suspects. Here's how I think about this. I always think about who's got the assets and who doesn't. So here's a little story about the baby boomers, my favorite slice of humanity, the people that got everything for free or quasi-free and then basically stuffed their own grandkids because they don't want to pay taxes. Right. So if you <laughs> shout out for the millennials there, it's grandma's <laughs> fault. Yeah, you, now, you've got a couple of millennials right here that are big fans of that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's true, right? You know, I'm not making this up. Right. So here's one for you, right? 80% of all financial assets in the United States are owned by baby boomers. Fact one. Here's fact two. 50% of boomers have no financial assets whatsoever. Fact three, around 22% of Ezra accounts, 401ks, Roth IRAs, etc., have money in them. The rest don't. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you there's a tremendous inequality skew going on. Because if half of all boomers have nothing and 80% of accounts have nothing, then it must all be at the top. And it turns out that's true. There's a perfect Pareto inequality. There's an 80-20 split within the boomers themselves. And what that means is the top 20% of boomers own 80% of that 80%. So that means 20% of a small slice of the population who are all old own 64% of everything. Now, what does that mean? That means that them and people like me, I'm a Gen X or who's almost old enough to be a boomer, which means I basically got to benefit from all this shit too and the millennials got stuffed, right? My healthcare plan, even though it's one with a big deductible, is pretty damn good. And their healthcare plans, oh my God, they're the, the proverbial Cadillacs. And not just that, the ones that have the financial assets, right? They could spend, as many of them do and many of them will, $300,000 basically trying to prolong their life when they've got terminal cancer and having the worst three months that anyone could ever wish upon themselves and spending all this money for it. And they'll still have $2 million or more to bequeath their kids. So when you, and remember the 80th percentile thing also works for voting, you're the people who count, right? So when you say to them, let's go single payer, what you're saying is, we want to take away your right to waste hundreds of thousands of dollars on futile end of life treatment, which is when the most of healthcare expenditures happen. We actually want to have a rational distribution so that we can benefit more people, particularly as you go down the age distribution, because as you go further down, less and less people have healthcare. And the notion that you're young and you're healthy, you don't need it, is completely fallacious. Because if you break your leg and you need an ambulance, you don't have healthcare, that's $3,000 out of pocket before you even get in the hospital. If you're involved in a drive-by shooting and you have to do surgery on you, they will hound you for $200,000 for the rest of your life. So we need to have this type of system. 
And the people who have got everything already, you know what their answer is? What do you think? <laughs> well, uh, that that is uh, that is depressing, uh, but uh, well, perhaps with the passage thing, of though, time. Society evolves one funeral at a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, I mean, yeah, nothing optimistic like a funeral, right? <laughs> um, hey, listen, I'm half Irish. We have a great time at funerals. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, so Mark, I know you're a political economist, not a prognosticator, but I'm looking at what strikes me as a devastating crash on the horizon, because when you have tax-dodging giant corporations at the multi-billion or even trillion-dollar level like Apple, using the campaign finance system, like you mentioned, to legally bribe politicians into making policy that helps the corporations consolidate their wealth and power, and then... They game the markets and artificially inflate their stock value using tactics that used to be illegal, like stock buybacks. The, the economic system seems like a giant house of cards teetering in the wind. Am I wrong? Well, I'm not sure it's a house of cards. I mean, it can be very robust and very corrupt at the same time. So my house of cards is different. I actually worry about the whole shift into passive investment vehicles. So for all you millennials that don't have any investments, here's something you might want to think about. Uh, you know when you get these little apps that say, I'll do that, I'll do investing for you, and you can choose if you want to be a little bit risky or not, whatever, right? These are all algorithms. This is passive investing. There's no active management there. So your fidelities and all these people that used to basically give you um, kind of choices to invest your pension if you had a pension fund at all, and, and they charged you fees, and it was quite expensive, and the returns were good sometimes, but not so good the other time. Forget it. We'll just track indexes. So you have all these products, whether they're like microsecond algorithm trades all the way through to ETFs, exchange traded funds, to the life cycle funds and pensions that, that we have today that are passive vehicles, whereby there's no humans allowed. Now, there's a friend of mine called Megan Green, who's the chief economist at Man U Life in Boston. She had a piece in the Financial Times last week, and it's a brilliant piece. If you can get past the firewall, have a look at it. And she says, imagine the following. Imagine you went to the doctor and you said, oh, I'm feeling a bit iffy and you know, my knee hurts and I've got this thing in my stomach and my throat feels a bit weird. And the doctor turned around and said this to you. Look, I don't know anything about medicine. I don't know anything about underlying things to do with blood or cells or any of that stuff. Literally, I know nothing. I'm a trend follower. What I do is I can basically predict what's going to happen to your throat over the next 72 microseconds. Or I can say on average, looking at 100 million cases of people this many of them die of that, given your demographics, you're probably okay. You'd be like, you're a charlatan. You don't know anything, and you would walk out. Yet that's what we've done with half the US equities market. Because none of these funds actually give a damn about the underlying processes, what we sometimes call the fundamentals. They're simply trading on momentum and patterns, and all this big data mining, all the rest of it is that. Now, if that's not scary enough, consider the following. When you murder all the people who used to charge you fees because it's cheap, therefore it's good, therefore it's efficient, what these people used to do is provide that thing that's really fine, critical for financial markets. It's called liquidity. So when Fidelity saw a stock falling, they would usually go, okay, so what's the history of that stock? What does it look like, blah, blah, blah? What's the underlines on the firm? What's the underlines in the sector? Yeah, there's no reason for it to be 20% under. I'm going to buy it. And the action of buying it transfers cash into the market. So that's providing liquidity. Now, you've murdered that industry. And we're basically moving into passives at a rate whereby half the market is now passive, we're under another five or six years. Practically, there'll be no active management left. When you're on that side, and let's say the robots meet something that they've never seen before, there's a big market incident, they're all on orders to not hold cash, they can basically buy within certain tolerances, but after that, they sell. What if there's nobody on the buy side? What if there's no money on the buy side and they all try and sell at once? And we've seen this already many times in flash crashes, but they've been very quick. It's just happened in the algo space. But what would it to happen in the ETF space where so much money is invested? That is a giant financial crisis waiting to happen. Yikes. All right. Well, <laughs> listeners, you heard it here first. I'm not the only one who's saying this. Trust me, there's quite a few people are catching on to this now. But Meg, I do encourage everybody to read Megan's op-ed because she just writes about it in an incredibly clear way. And the way that I went, oh, yeah, that's it. That's really it. You've totally nailed it. We've basically handed the market over to people who say, I don't understand markets. I'm just a trend follower. Come with me. Mm. That's brutal. <laughs> yeah, but um, it's so accurate. Um, 
So, Mark, as I mentioned prior to the beginning of this interview, these issues are very personal for us. The economic inequality and the political fallout that comes from that, that's something that's acutely felt here in Binghamton. And I understand that these economic and political considerations are also personal for you, given your background. So my co-host has a question about that. Uh, As Jim just mentioned, uh, as someone that didn't grow up particularly wealthy, your story of intergenerational upward mobility through the use of a welfare system really resonated with me, especially given today's negative rhetoric surrounding public assistance. Uh, So I'm curious to know, in what ways did public programs help you move from low income to being an Ivy League professor? Without them, it wouldn't have happened. But, But there is a caveat I want to talk about on this, which is the way that the Trump administration is doing immigration. So let me try and bring this into this, because I think there's an important point to be made. Great. So let's start with the following. I'm an Ivy League professor. What does that mean? It means that I live in a society and I get a relatively high income. What that also means is I pay relatively high taxes. And because of that, I fund a lot of government expenditure. So any investment that was made in me as a child and as a young man to get to this level has been paid back many times over by the fact that had I not had that investment, had I not gone to university, my lifetime earning would have been much lower. My tax generation would have been much lower. Therefore, it's a net positive that I went through this. Okay. Now, here's your caveat. But all the investment was done by the British government and all the benefits go to the American government because I'm an immigrant. Right. Right. Okay, now let's go with this. Let's go with this. Just hold that for a second as a thought. Now let's go back over. We get to uh, Dundee, Scotland, 1967. My mother dies basically shortly after childbirth. I'm raised by my grandmother. She was a borderline alcoholic who found the border and went straight over it as fast as possible. Mm. Um, So what kept me going? I had good teachers. I had good schools. Everybody went to the local schools, the middle classes as well. You had role models and parents that weren't total fuck-ups. They ran clubs. They uh, taught you to play football. They looked out for you, looked out for each other because of a sense of community and a sense of neighborhood. We weren't living in separate class bubbles, such that even though I grew up in a very working class area, I ended up playing rugby rather than soccer when I was a kid, which is a very middle class sport, which introduced me to middle class kids, which made me want to read more. So I did well at school because I did well at school. I could go to university. Why? Because it was free. Not only was it free, I was so broke, they gave me a grant for my living expenses. So I got free tuition and a grant for living expenses because bottom 20 percentile, it was probably bottom 10 percentile. And it wasn't that unusual for people like me to go because it was free. Now, if you just said, oh, these days that's solved because we all have student loans. Well, one of the big problems with student loans is you need relatively complete financial records. Um, Anybody tell me where my alcoholic grandmother and absent father would generate the financial records necessary to apply for a loan from would be? That's right. Around 30% of kids in the United States who would qualify for a 1600 SAT 10 years ago couldn't go to college because of incomplete financial records. Mm. Huge waste of talent, right? They're not a problem in the British system. So I go through the British system and then I want to go to grad school, the best grad schools in the United States. So I go to the United States, I get an F1 visa, I come over. And then I really like it here and I've got a great girlfriend at the time. So I want to stay. So I get practical training. And then I apply for a job at Johns Hopkins. I got a job at Johns Hopkins. They put me on a a J1 exchange visa. Then they put me on an H1 visa as a skilled technical worker. And I go from that to a green card. And then I actually meet my wife and I bring her in because she's a European. And we jump through all the immigration hoops and eventually we become citizens. Now, you know, that's how that worked. And anybody who tells me the welfare state makes people lazy is, I'll just, I, I, I will disagree with every fiber of my body because I'm not alone in this experience. That's what made uh, mobility possible. And when you destroy those institutions, that's why mobility sucks so bad, particularly in this country. But the broader point I think is, is germane just now is let's ask the following question. Is it fair that the British government made all that investment on me and then I get to go to America and pay those taxes? I mean, I would, my opinion might be a little different. I would argue yes, because I, you know, view us as, I view us on the global level and at the species level, so I think it's a good investment in humanity. But I understand your point that a, a nation state is going to object to that. But we'll think about it this way. They made all the investment and essentially the United States gets to steal the assets. Yeah, I mean, I do okay. hear you. But, no, but, but here, this is what this also goes on to, right? So let's think about the tech sector suppressing wages and the lack of skilled training in many fields for Americans because it's so much easier to import people. It's called the H-1B program. Mm. 
Now, there's a reason this is in the crosshairs, because even somebody like me who's on the left has to admit that there's something wrong with a program that allows f firms that are already making super profits to not invest in their workforces because you can basically steal talent that's generated abroad. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with that. And that's why that resonates with so many people in Trump country, because they get that there's something seriously wrong with that. And the problem with particularly the liberal sort of globalist left is they cannot see any downside to this or immigration issues at all. Anything like that is fine. And anybody who says that there's a problem with it is clearly on the wrong side of the fence. I think we need to think smarter about that and take seriously the concerns of people who find themselves on the wrong side of that trade. Definitely. I mean, I definitely think we we need to take their economic concerns seriously. And uh, I definitely think, obviously, we understand this in the context of a, of a deep embedded history of racism throughout the United States. Uh, but of course, those concerns are exacerbated by economic anxiety and even some, like you're mentioning now, even some rational considerations. So it's... Totally. And, you know, I've said this one before. I mean, this is the way that I look at it. When, when somebody says to me, are you in favor of immigration? I say, of course I am. I'm an immigrant. But when I think of an immigrant, I think of somebody who's going to move into my neighborhood, which means they probably have a PhD or they work for GE. They're going to buy a nice house, their kid's going to play with my kid, and we're all going to go to the same snotty private school together. They don't cost me anything. It's a net gain. If I'm living in public assistance in Europe and I'm constantly told there's no money for anything and you're a loser and you don't fit and you don't try hard, and then suddenly a couple hundred thousand people kip up from a foreign country and there's language training and schools and everything else. Why are we even surprised that politicians can capitalize on this? Mm. That's not a surprise. That's the most obvious thing in the world. Yeah. All right. Well, that takes us to the end of our questions. And it's been very enlightening. You've uh, you've done really well to explain a lot of these complex systems and, and how we've gotten to the point that we've gotten to today, Mark. So I really appreciate you being here. I'm very glad to have been here and I hope that your listeners find value in it. And if they don't, they're totally free to write me hate mail, as many people do, but I never read it, so don't bother. Oh, they, they can write us hate mail too, and we'll read it on the air. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> How about you read my hate mail for me and don't tell me about it? <laughs> <laughs> That'll be great. I don't care. It's totally fine. We can do like dramatic readings of it. Yeah, we'll do some dramatic reenactments. That would be good. Absolutely. I like that. You have to do it in sort of like, you know, really sort of four English dramatic accents. <laughs> <laughs> A Shakespearean reading of, oh, thou doth sucketh. <laughs> that would be quite something. All right. Well, it's been fun, Mark, and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you so All much. Right, cheers, all of us. We'd like to thank Jamie Willard for providing background music. You can find more of his music on YouTube. We'd also like to thank Adam Schultz for the Pineal Express logo. If you like Pineal Express, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash pinealexpress and consider pledging your support in exchange for patron rewards, including extra show episodes and content. If you can't pledge your support, please consider giving us a positive rating and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to patrons like Tara Lee and Harris Hajiabdich. Your support helps us to keep Pineal Express running.